Romancing the Stone. Very enjoyable movie full of action, adventure, as well as comedy and romance. Released in 1984, it tells the story of romance novelist Joan Wilder, played by Kathleen Turner, who must travel to Columbia with a treasure map in order to save her sister, who has been kidnapped. Where she meets Jack T. Colton, played by Michael Douglas, the T stands for trustworthy, who joins Wilder on her quest in order for him to seek financial rewards. But as the two go on many misadventures and many close scrapes, an unexpected romance blooms between the two. All while Danny DeVito's bumbling Ralph character is caught in the middle of this fiasco, in this crowd-pleasing classic. So yeah, I'm back in my studio, but unfortunately I still don't have my background as my stuff is still in storage. But if you look at the background and pretend all my stuff is there, then you'll see it. Just like in the movie Hook when the Lost Boys are having their big meal and they pretend it's there and that's how they eat it. So if you just concentrate and pretend that the usual background is there, you will see it. See what I mean? Looks as good as ever, doesn't it? So anyway, 10 things that you didn't know about romancing the stone, let's go! Number 10, a promising writing career cut short too soon. The script for Romancing the Stone was written by Diane Thomas. At the time of writing the script for Romancing the Stone, she was working as a waitress in Malibu, and this was her first working script. Upon completing the script, her agent was pitching it to studios, where it took less than a week for the script to be picked up, in which it was picked up by actor and producer Michael Douglas, along with Columbia Pictures. And this was seemingly Thomas's big break. Thanks to her romancing the Stone script, she was now sought after, where she was even collaborating with Steven Spielberg to write the scripts for Always and the third Indiana Jones movie, which would become Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Sadly though, tragedy strikes, where just a year and a half after the release of Romancing the Stone, Diane Thomas was tragically killed in a car accident, with Romancing the Stone being her only completed script, and the world was sadly robbed of a very talented uprising scriptwriter. Number 9. The Indiana Jones Dilemma now, just to go off topic here, but as we all know, in 1981, Raiders of the Lost Ark was released, and it was a huge, massive success. This got movie audiences enthusiastic for adventurous, swashbuckling movies. And in its wake, there were several Raiders of the Lost Ark-inspired movies, including the canon Alan Quartermain films, Sky Pirates, High Road to China, Firewalker, Tennessee Buck, and Jungle Raiders, to name but a few. Heck, even the James Bond movies got involved in the Indiana Jones adventure-style formula with Octopussy. Now, Romancing the Stone often gets lumbered in the taking after Raiders of the Lost Ark category, but this couldn't be further from the truth. As writer, Diane Thomas actually wrote the script in 1978, and Raiders didn't come out until 1981. Heck, the Romancing the Stone script was even written before the Raiders of the Lost Ark script itself, which was written in 1979. So don't forget, despite the popular belief that Romancing the Stone is just another run-of-the-mill movies to be released in the wake of Raiders of the Lost Ark, its genesis actually predates it. Number 8. Robert Zemeckis walked away from another movie to direct Romancing the Stone. So when Michael Douglas first purchased Romancing the Stone, it was with Columbia Pictures, but as time went on, the rights had switched to 20th Century Fox. At this time, director Robert Zemeckis was trying to get his passion project off the ground, but no studio wanted to invest in it. That project was, of course, Back to the Future. But sadly at that stage, no one believed in him or his movie. 
I guess you have to remember that up until that point, the only two movies that he had directed were the comedies I Wanna Hold Your Hand and Use Cars, both of which were considered to be flops. So he wasn't exactly sought after. He did, however, manage to get a directing job with 20th Century Fox to direct the movie Cocoon. However, it was while in the early stages of developing Cocoon that Zemeckis found out about romancing the stone, and that was the picture that he really wanted to make. 20th Century Fox were at first hesitant to give him that particular project, once again thanks to I Want to Hold Your Hand and Used Cars, but they eventually gave in and assigned Zemeckis as director of Romancing the Stone, with Cocoon being put on hold. And just like that, a directing legend was born. Number 7. Casting Possibilities one of the greatest appeals to Romancing the Stone is the on-screen chemistry between Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner. Wow, did the production hit gold with these two. However, that nearly wasn't the case. Originally, Romancing the Stone was going to be a Sylvester Stallone vehicle, as the Hollywood tough man was the original choice for Jack T. Colton, but he turned it down to star in Rhinestone instead. Huh, <laughs> well, from Romance Stone to Rhinestone, I guess. Other potential Coltons include Christopher Reeve, Clint Eastwood, Jack Nicholson, and Burt Reynolds, till the movie's producer Michael Douglas himself decided that he'll step into the part. Deborah Ringer was considered for Joan Wilder, as well as Jessica Lange, but Kathleen Turner got the part thanks to her role in the movie Body Heat. Bob Hoskins was offered to play the part of the bumbling Ralph, but he turned it down, so instead the part went to Danny DeVito, who is definitely this movie's comic relief. And of course, Bob Hoskins would eventually go on to work with Robert Zemeckis a few years later in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. He played Eddie Valiant. Number 6. Filming Location Romancing the Stone was set to be filmed where the movie is based in, Columbia, but according to 15facts.com, it was decided that it may be too unsafe to film at the location due to a string of real-life kidnappings taking place at the time. The irony being Romancing the Stone is about a Colombian kidnapping. So instead, the movie was shot around Mexico. During the shoot, Kathleen Turner supposedly really didn't get along with director Robert Zemeckis, and they had, quote, terrible arguments. I think the arguments stemmed from Zemeckis being more into the technical aspects of filmmaking with the cameras and special effects, and that just clashed with Turner's style of acting. Filming Romancing the Stone was considered dangerous, as all the stunts were performed live, and the crew had to battle nature, what with storms and mudslides, thanks to filming taking place during the rainy season. Filming was also tough thanks to all the local wildlife, thanks to all the bugs, snakes and alligators. In fact, the alligators that were used in the film were brought into the production by a trainer, to be used specifically for romancing the stone. But one of them escaped and headed out into the wild. I guess it thought to itself, FREEDOM! And when the trainer tracked the alligator down, there was something of a scuffle, where the trainer's hand was mauled, and the alligator, who, let's be honest, was being kind of a dick, pulled the injured trainer into the water and started to spin him. Yikes. Thankfully, the trainer was saved by the crew manager and made a full recovery. And, you know, didn't become an alligator happy meal. Number 5. The dancing was real, but the snake bite was not. During filming of Romancing the Stone, it wasn't all bad weather and scary wildlife, as the actors really got to let their hair down. Namely the scene where we see the Colton character dancing with Wilder, which is considered a standout moment in the movie. Well, this scene came to be because one night, while on location, Michael Douglas started dancing with Kathleen Turner. They were just letting loose. However, Zemeckis saw this and thought that the dancing looked great and started to record them. And this is how the scene came to be. But yeah, at the time, neither Douglas or Turner knew that they were being filmed. Now, there's something of an urban legend associated with Romancing the Stone, that while filming on location, a venomous snake bit Michael Douglas's hand, to which Danny DeVito rushed to his rescue and saved Douglas by sucking the venom out of the snake bite. And because of this, Douglas didn't die, thanks to his co-star and former roommate. However, despite this rumour sounding like a fun bedtime story, it is exactly that. A story, as Douglas himself would go on to say that this never happened. 
<laughs> so if you ever get bitten by a snake, you should still call for an ambulance before you call for Danny DeVito. <laughs> Number four, deleted scenes. Now, there were several scenes that were cut or refilmed after the movie's first test screening. Yeah, more on that later. Firstly, I can see why some of these scenes were reshot. When you see these original, unused cuts, Douglas and Turner do seem a little on edge and low in energy, as if the struggles of filming on location were getting a bit much and reflecting on their acting. Also, in some of the original versions of these scenes, the characters were just really unlikable and even questionable. There's just none of that charm or chemistry that would go on to shine in the final movie. Instead, the scenes with Colton and Wilder seem kind of angry and hostile, and I would never believe that these two characters would even remotely like each other at all, let alone fall in love, so I'm definitely in favour of the course correction. This feels less cute and more kind of awkward and downbeat. Also, there was a removed character called Richard, who is Joan's publicist. But once again, it gets really awkward when it's learned that Richard has feelings for Joan, which actually kind of freaks her out, as those feelings aren't reciprocated. Now, in the final film, the character was reworked into the Gloria character, which was definitely an improvement, making the character more of a protective best friend figure than some awkward guy who wants to have a relationship with Joan. Supposedly, changes were even being made very early on in the development, as it was written in to give the Joan Wilder character a pet cat, in an attempt to make her more likeable and relatable. There were also trims made to scenes that would end up in the movie. Once again, I think that this was wise, as these scenes of extra dialogue just would have slowed things down. All up, all the changes do make for a better movie. Number 3. Released Sequel and Scrap Sequel so given that Romancing the Stone was a huge success, a sequel was instantly greenlit, with Douglas, Turner and DeVito returning. But this time they were kind of being brought back kicking and screaming, as the actors were contractually obliged to return. Turner really didn't want to return as she apparently hated the script, and she was even threatened with a lawsuit if she didn't return. And to make matters worse, this time around, there wasn't Robert Zemeckis to give the movie his perfect touches, as he was too busy directing Back to the Future. So instead, the movie was directed by Louis Teague, who previously directed Alligator and Cujo. So it's here we get to 1985's The Jewel of the Nile. Now, I won't go into it too much, as it does deserve its own episode, but upon re-watching it recently, I felt something was just missing. It just didn't have the magic of romancing the stone, and I didn't like how Turner and Douglas spend most of the movie bickering at each other. One of the great aspects of the first movie is how sweet and cute and pure their chemistry is. It kind of sours things when they're just talking down at each other all the time. Still, it's not a bad movie, and it did give us the Billy Ocean song when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. And any movie that introduces that song can't be all bad. Now, there was to be a third movie called The Crimson Eagle, which was to see Colton and Wilder go on an adventure with their teenage children in Thailand, where they are blackmailed into stealing a precious statue. But due to the disappointing reception of Jewel of the Nile, this third entry kept getting pushed back more and more, until 1997 when Michael Douglas simply lost interest in it. Then jumped to 2005 and Douglas was working on yet another sequel, this time called Racing the Monsoon. Hey, that's a badass name. But once again, nothing came of it. Since then, there have been several talks and whispers of a Romancing the Stone remake, with rumours of a movie starring Gerard Butler as Colton to a Romancing the Stone rebooted TV show. Yep, we didn't get a Romancing the Stone remake. Oh no, what a shame. Yeah, as you can tell by my face and the tone of my voice, I'm really upset about that one. Darn it. Oh dear, how are we ever going to cope? Number two, the start of a musical partnership. So going back to Romancing the Stone's production, legendary movie composer James Horner was offered to score Romancing the Stone, but he declined. So Alan Silvestri was brought in to do a temporary score, one to help the movie for its production that was to be replaced. And at that stage, Silvestri had only scored the odd movie here and there, so his career hadn't exactly taken off yet. 
In fact, where he was at that point of time is kind of exactly where Zemeckis himself was too. But when Zemeckis would hear the music that Silvestri made for Romancing the Stone, he insisted that his music be used for the final film, which it was. And from there, a movie-making partnership was formed between Zemeckis and Silvestri. And Silvestri would go on to score all of Zemeckis' movies that followed, including Back to the Future, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Forrest Gump, and Castaway. And they're still working together now, hence the terrible recent live-action Pinocchio remake. Oh god, but the less we say about that, the better, hey? But regardless, this team-up is without a doubt one of the most important pairings in the history of cinema. And it all started with Romancing the Stone. And in addition to that, Kathleen Turner would also indeed work with Zemeckis again, when she would go on to voice the character of Jessica Rabbit in the as-mentioned Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Number 1. Cocoon Out and Back to the Future In so with Romancing the Stone completed and ready to be released, a test screening of the movie was done, which was disastrous. Yep, the audience hated it. 20th Century Fox had no faith in the movie. They were very sure that it was going to be a flop. Another movie like I Wanna Hold Your Hand and Use Cars, which Zemeckis had previously directed, which were also flops. In fact, 20th Century Fox was so sure that Romancing the Stone was going to be a box office disaster, they removed Zemeckis from the Cocoon production and replaced him with Ron Howard. Yeah, he was fired! And so, probably to their hesitation, Romancing the Stone was released in March 1984, and to the absolute shock of everyone, it's a massive hit. It made over $115 million on a $10 million budget, it was 20th Century Fox's highest grossing movie of 1984, and overall the sixth highest grossing movie of that year. So Romancing the Stone was big news, and Robert Zemeckis was now in demand, and had the leverage to make Back to the Future. In fact, Zemeckis said that Romancing the Stone allowed him to make Back to the Future. So to put it bluntly, if there was no Romancing the Stone, there would be no Back to the Future. And that's a timeline that I really don't want to think about. Critics-wise, there were some reviews that did see Romancing the Stone as an Indiana Jones clone, but many reviews praised Douglas's and Turner's amazing chemistry, as well as the movie's humour. Romancing the Stone is now considered a movie classic, and one of the greatest movies of the 1980s. I think its true appeal definitely lies in the on-screen chemistry between Douglas and Turner. But it also has a nice warm story. I like the idea of someone who is lonely, stuck in a mundane existence, and writes romance novels because they dream of adventures, only to find themselves on a real-life adventure just like one of their novels, which is a fun concept. Romancing the Stone is a very enjoyable feel-good movie, with plenty of heart, adventure, and romance. What more could you ask for? It's honestly a fun, sweet, and charming feel-good movie. By the end, it really gets you in the feels, and you're glad that these characters found each other, and that you got to go on this journey with them. It really is an enjoyable movie, the kind that you stick on on a Sunday afternoon, and just go along with it and have a great time. Anyway, I'm Minty, and it would be totally hilarious if there ever was a movie scene where Michael Douglas gets bitten on the hand by a snake, and Danny DeVito has to suck all the venom out of it. <coughs> See ya!